So hello everyone uh, from your various time zones. Good morning, good evening. I'm Catherine Wilhelm at the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to bring you today's program, which is called uh, CEDAW and the Korean uh, Women's Movement. Of course, CEDAW refers to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And this is the third webinar in our series about CEDAW and gender equality. The previous two webinars focused on CEDAW and women's property rights and on how CEDAW is implemented in East Asia. We recorded both of those programs. You can watch them on our website uh, in both English and Chinese. And today's program is also being translated simultaneously into Chinese. Today's speaker, Oh Kyung Jin, is the executive director of the largest women's organization in South Korea, Korea Women's Associations United. And KWAU is an umbrella organization made up of 28 member organizations. Its mission is to achieve gender equality through collective action. And it does this by promoting gender mainstreaming strategies to make the legal and institutional systems in South Korea more gender equal. Kim Jin has been active in promoting women's rights for many years. Before she joined the Korea Women's Association United, she led one of its member organizations, the Korea Women's Political Solidarity. She's also interested in transnational feminist networks, which is how I came to know about her work and to meet her. She is uh, engaged in Asian regional women's groups and participates in the global networking that takes place every year in March in New York when the Commission on the Status of Women holds its annual meeting. Kyung Jin is going to share the story of the Korean women's movement over the past 30 years. It's a story of considerable success but also some failures. For example, the persistently large wage gap between men and women in, in South Korea. We've put together a PDF of some relevant reading materials, uh, also in, in Chinese and English, for those of you who want to understand more about the situation of women in South Korea. And you can find the link to that material uh, in our chat and it's also on our website. And now one last thing before I invite Kyung Jin to begin speaking, we're going to conduct a quick on-screen poll of the audience so that she can better understand who it is she's speaking to. After that question, then there's a second quick question. How familiar are you with the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women? So it looks like most everybody has some level of familiarity with the convention, um, but many people are, say, little or no knowledge. Now, we want this program to be as interactive as possible. So we invite everybody to post questions, comments in the chat box as we go along, and also suggestions you may have for what our next webinar in this series should be about. Thank you for participating in our mini poll. Uh, Kyung Jin, the floor is yours. Um, Catherine, uh, thank you very much for your invitation and warm introduction. Um, my name is Kyung Jin Oh. I'm working for Korea Women's Associations United, or KWAU. Uh, today, uh, my presentation is about women's rights activism and current agendas in South Korea. Uh, especially, I will focus on the key strategies that Korean women's movement have been historically using so far um, to put forward the agendas and demands to the government, including the active use of the CEDO mechanisms, and also the current challenges that women and women's movement have faced in Korea. Uh, especially, we are now uh, in a very difficult political environment um, because of there are so many political backlashes which are mainly caused by the new government uh, led by Yoon suk yeol who uh, took office as a president last year. Mm. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, my organization, KWAU. Uh, the full name is Korea Women's Associations United. 
Um, this is an umbrella organization in women's rights. Um, this organization was founded in 1987. Uh, it's an umbrella organization. We have seven chapters in South Korea. Uh, you can see the brief picture of KWAU structure. You see there are 30 member organizations. You can see how uh, KWAU uh, structured uh, in this map. So um, we have a lot of objectives as we have so many uh, member organizations dealing with diverse women's rights movement. Um, for example, um, we have objectives related to gender-based violence and discrimination, also women's labor rights, together work and together care, and also vulnerable group of women, uh, such as migrant women, single parent women. Also, we are working on women's representation in politics. Also, we are working on um, increasing, enhancing a peace and also achieving to achieve reuni peaceful reunification on the Korean Peninsula. Mm. Also, uh, as on KWAU is an umbrella organization of diverse women's feminist activists, uh, one of the main focuses is to facilitate solidarity and collective actions in women's groups and to amplify women's voices across the local and national and international boundaries. I uh, just want to uh, briefly introduce about how Korean women's movement have been developed for the last 40 years. Uh, as you see in the map, uh, Korea women's movement has developed um, relating um, various relationships with the state and society and also uh, international communities. Uh, you can see uh, in the here on the last part, the low part, um, Korea achieved the former democratization in 19, 1987. Uh, before that, of course, there were uh, several movements for women's labor rights and also human rights, even during the dictatorship before the 1980s. Uh, however, after the late 1980s, um, the senior feminist and human rights activists who had actively worked for uh, Korean democratization, uh, they saw the need for a unified women's movement. So um, they um, founded KWAU, an umbrella organization of women's rights, in 1987, and the year where uh, the Korea achieved the democratization. Uh, also, when you see the global level, um, South Korea also ratified the CEDAW Convention in 1984, and um, also, you see uh, there were um, rapid development of global norms on human rights, women's human rights at the international level. Uh, we see um, in 1995, there was a fourth international conference on women. As a result of that, uh, the Beijing Platform for Action was adopted and the main, uh, politic main policy tool as a BPFA was gender mainstreaming. Uh, when you see at the uh, where the national level, uh, from 1998 to 2007, we had two progressive governments. Uh, so during this time from 1998 to early 2000, there were a rapid development of policy framework on gender equality. Hmm. Also in 1997, we had to go through IMF economic crisis. Uh, at that time, the women are, women's economic situation have become very, uh, very severe and poor. At that time, the women's agenda was uh, human rights, women's economic human rights at that time. Uh, also, uh, in 2001, uh, the gender ministry was established, uh, the feminist engagement during that time. 
Uh, you see in 1980s, uh, before uh, Korea's democratization, uh, there were several organizing on women's rights and democratic movements, even uh, against the military dictatorship. And uh, after 1987, there are uh, many women's rights organizations, especially progressive ones, have been uh, established. Um, and uh, in 1990s, uh, one of the key agendas of women's group was to institutionalize gender in all government ministry, along with the uh, policy framework uh, dedicated to women's rights. Uh, and they also, the women's groups also at the time demanded to establish the government ministry uh, exclusively dealing with gender equality. Uh, so 1990s, uh, women's groups actually uh, actively used the international mechanism, which is the Beijing Platform for Action, uh, which was adopted in 1995, uh, because the BPFA introduced the gender mainstreaming as an effective policy tool uh, to reflect uh, gender in all policy processes. Uh, it also emphasized that the national machinery dedicated to women is also needed. Uh, I said that from 1990s to early 2000s, there have been rapid developments of legal and policy framework on women's rights in Korea. I think the main factors for that were a strong women's movement and also the two consecutive progressive governments. Uh, these two governments were uh, relatively in favor of women's, women's groups and women's rights agenda. And also there were uh, rapid developments of global norms on women's rights. So these three factors were a huge contribution to the development of women's policies at the national level in 1990s. So from, from 2000s to 2020s, uh, what happened in Korean society? Uh, you, you all know that at the global level, um, there was a growing influence of neoliberalist neoliberal, policies uh, from late 2000s up until now. Um, Korea was not also an exception. So uh, going to the late 2000s, there was a growing influence of neoliberalism at both international and national levels. And also at the national levels, there were two consecutive conservative governments to regime uh, from late 2000 to, um, to 2016. And these two conservative governments in Korea were very much hostile to women's agendas as well as civil society itself. Therefore, there were not much advancements in terms of gender equality until 2015. Rather, at that time, the civil society space has been shrinked very much and women's agenda have been regressed, have become very much regressive. However, uh, since 2015, there has been some positive changes started uh, from women's young feminists. Um, there were uh, several tipping points uh, in terms of young feminist activism. Uh, for example, uh, young feminist activists started to be organized around the theme of ending digital sexual violence. Mm, in 2016, uh, there was an incident where a young woman was indiscriminately killed by one man who, he, who was a misogynist uh, near Gangnam subway station. He said um, he killed uh, one woman randomly because uh, he was looked down on by women. Um, so this tragedy actually led to a huge anger among young women and it led to the massive organizing in Korean society. And also uh, at the national level, we had uh, a civil movement against the corruption of the President Park Geun-hye in 2016. 
It finally led to the impeachment of the president, president in 2017. Um, <clears throat> so after that, there was a next president who is Moon Jae-in. Uh, he was relatively uh, from a progressive party and he called himself as a feminist during his presidential campaign. So uh, the political environment surrounding the women's movement has been actually rapidly changed um, since 2017. So you, you also can see at the global level, there are uh, some rapid change, changes in terms of women's rights movement. For example, in 2017, there was a global Me Too movement. Uh, also, there are the rapid developments of young feminist activists, not only in Korea, but also in East Asia uh, and at the international communities. So these are the feminist engagements um, points from 2000s to 2020s. So from 2000, from 2000, uh, women's groups demanded uh, women's participation in politics in decision making. It was one of the key agendas in um, 2000. I will uh, explain in detail uh, in the later slides. Also, um, women's groups advocated for women as active agents of change for inclusive development. Uh, and uh, from 2000 to 2020s, uh, women's key agendas are um, like transforming social norms to narrow gaps between law and practices in order to accelerate substantive gender equality. The reason is that, uh, as I said before, uh, there was a rapid changes and developments in terms of legal and policy framework from 1990s to early 2000 in Korea. So we have certain level of law and policy uh, for gender equality, but uh, in daily lives, women are still being discriminated and experience, experiencing gender-based violence. So it means that uh, even though we have law and policies, uh, women's lives have not been changed much. So there are uh, big gaps still between law and practices. So nowadays women's rights groups are focusing on how can we actually change the women's daily lives, especially young women and uh, vulnerable groups of women such as uh, single parents, migrant women and um, women with disabilities, yes, and so on. So um, nowadays, women's groups uh, great concern is to how to accelerate substantive gender equality and how can change the real women's lives. Mm. Also, there are uh, many emerging agendas like digital sexual violence and like, LGBT rights. So we are also focusing on them. Okay, I just want to uh, briefly uh, show how um, the Korea women's movement uh, used the strategies, especially um, international and domestic uh, domestic strategies. I just want to uh, show one example, how uh, the Hoju system abolition um, in Korean society, it's really patriarchal society in Korea. Uh, we had Hoju system. Hoju system basically a male oriented family registry system. So under Hoju system, uh, women's property rights and uh, rights have been um, discriminated in many areas. So uh, abolition of Hoju system was um, the one of the key agendas among Korean women's groups for many years, but it finally actually was abolished in 2005. So uh, for this, agenda, uh, women use the, women's groups used a lot of strategies. For example, we um, like diverse street rallies and petitions calling for the abolishment of Hoju. And we also uh, established a broad, broad network, not only in women's rights groups, wow. but also lay lawyers, 
uh, media influencers, and also the government officers and politicians who are in favor of this agenda. Uh, when you see uh, this picture, the middle one, uh, actually he is, a, he is a public figure. He is an um, actor, Korean, Korean famous actor. And then he was um, advocating for this agenda. So he, try, he also worked with us like to participate in street rallies and also spoke for at the press conference agenda. So um, be, uh, thanks to him, uh, ordinary people could know about this agenda very much. Also, uh, we advocated for, advocated to the politicians uh, in the National Assembly because if we want to abolish this Hojo system, we have we had to change the law and policies. It means that uh, we had to persuade the politicians who have a power to revise the law. So at that time, um, women's groups actually thought that there is urgent need for us to increase the number of women politicians in the National Assembly because we had to secure certain number of politicians who are in favor of uh, women's rights agendas because they have to uh, they have to get vote to revise or um, make the law and policies to change the law change the women's real lives and also we um, used actively used the international mechanisms such as CEDO. Um, you know that like the countries which ratify the CEDO convention should or revise the law and policies which there are gen if there are gender discriminatory provisions in them so um women's rights groups in korea actively use this CEDO mechanism um demanding that uh we korean government should revise the policies and law on according to the CEDO mechanisms that uh, that the korea government has ratified even like already 20 years ago. Uh, or I just want to uh, briefly explain about the strategies to increase the number of number of women's politicians in nation in the National Assembly. I um, said that uh, when women's groups were actively advocating for the abolishment of Hojo system, um, they thought that um, certain number of women politician is really, really important because they would be the key members who can actually um, exercise the power to um, change the legal system towards the gender equality. So uh, increasing, the, increasing the women's representation in politics was the key agenda for Korean women's groups. So um, to increase the women's representation, uh, we thought that uh, at the, ad the adoption and advancement of gender quota system was the key strategy. So uh, we established the civil society coalitions uh, consisting of more than 300 organizations. Um, also uh, agenda making by organizing seminars, submitting uh, petitions to the par parliament and lobbying to the political leaders. Also, uh, we uh, tried to make the list of prospective fe female candidates for party nominations in the 2004 uh, general election. Why we did that? Because when we are uh, trying to advocate for this agenda, the elite male politicians always says that uh, even though we want to um, nominate women politicians, there are not many women who want to become politicians or who are entitled to that. So uh, women's rights group themselves made the list of prospective uh, female candidates. So we have this, non we have this list, so you can also 
you can do that for party nominations. So this is one of the key strategies for us to make use of. Uh, also, uh, the key agenda in 1990 was the creation of the gender ministry. So uh, at that time, the women's rights groups thought that um, there were a rapid advancement of legal and policy framework. Then also we need the gender ministry, which is dedicated to uh, implementing these legal and policies uh, for women's rights. So uh, women's rights groups actively uh, demanded for the creation of gender ministry. Um, at that time, we uh, used the international mechanism, the Beijing Platform for Action, because uh, Beijing Platform for Action um, mentioned that there is a need to um, establish a national machinery dedicated to women's rights and gender equality. So um, at that time, at that time, the women's rights groups uh, used this. Uh, international mechanisms to put forward this agenda to the government. And at that time, uh, there was a progressive government uh, who it was in favor of women's rights agenda. So uh, the creation of the gender ministry was actually brought uh, by strong women's activism and also uh, the government officials at first uh, who was in favor of women's rights agenda. So uh, nowadays in the Yoon song yeol government, uh, he tries to abolish the gender ministry uh, from last year. So we are thinking that like abolishment of gender ministry agenda is not just about abolishing one uh, other ministry, other means, other means, other administrative institution, but it is more about uh, regressive waves of the strong women's activism because the creation of gender ministry itself is the result of strong women's activism. So now we are strongly against this uh, President Yoon's um, policy vision for that. So um, there was a rapid increase in the political participation of women. Uh, you can see here uh, the proportion of female member of the National Assembly has been rapidly increased from 2000 to 2022. Also, a proportion of female member of local councils was also rapidly increased from this during that time. These are exactly the result of the advancement of legal gender quota system. But uh, here are uh, 2012 and 2014. But what now, <laughs> as of 20, 2023, the proportion of women politicians in the National Assembly is still 19%. Also, uh, when you look at the local governments, in the municipal councils, the proportion of women politicians are only 14%. And at the local councils, uh, only 25%. These are the result of 2022, the last year local election. So you see, uh, we had a rapid increase uh, from 2000 to 2012, when uh, the gender quota system was rapidly advanced. But after that, uh, there are not many changes in terms of the proportion of women politicians. So these are the gap. Uh, of course, the gender quota system in Korea is not perfect. Some of them are compulsory provisions, but some of them are not. Just They are just recommendation provisions. So the party leaders don't want to keep this rule. So the women's rights groups are trying to um, uh, trying to change this law so that all legal gender quota systems can are a compulsory, compulsory provision so that the political party leaders should keep this rule. But still um, we have we are struggling about we are struggling for pushing these agendas because nowadays the president Yoon says that and the leading parties that 
think that this legal gender quota system is like, it's like too much benefits for women. It is as a form of reverse discrimination. So now uh, women's rights policies are uh, going backward under the current regime and gender quota system is one of the factors that one of the examples that um, the anti-feminist sentiments are relating to. I will not uh, go detail about all these uh, legal and policy, policy framework uh, development over the past 30 years, but these are the, the main legal and policy frameworks uh, in terms of women's rights from 1980s until 2000s. You see, uh, from like from 1990s to early 2000, there were so many uh, developments and establishment of law and policy network. Okay, so just want to um, focus on the current dynamics of women's agendas movement. We have there are so many <laughs> so many developments nowadays. Um, you see. Um, for the last 10 years, we had also rapid changes in terms of women's rights and civil rights movement. Uh, from 2008 to 2016, uh, during the period of uh, two consecutive governments, women's policies were not advanced, rather deteriorated, and the space for civil society was shrunk because these government at that time, these governments were not uh, in favor of civil society, civil society organizations. However, we had a uh, 2016. There was a candlelight civil movement, and as a result of this, uh, President Park Geun Hye was impeached, and um, feminist <laughs> President Moon Jae In took office, um, and we had the Me Too movement, the nationwide Me Too movement in 2018. And uh, during that time, there was the growing influence of young feminist activism. And uh, after two years, uh, we had anti-feminist Yoon sung Yeol as a president. Uh, he took office uh, in 2022, last year, May. And one year has passed, and there are so many areas that were uh, regressive, that have become regressive in terms of women's rights. Before going into the details about the Yoon Sung Yeol's um, regressive agendas, I just want to um, highlight two major trends in terms of women's movement before uh, Yoon Sung Yeol regime. On the one hand, there was a growing influence of young feminist activism. Uh, I already said that there are several tipping points of uh, development of young feminist activism. Uh, one is the misogynistic murder against women near Gangnam Station in 2016. And the second one is that um, Fighting for, fighting for the elimination of online gender-based violence. We had several uh, key events in terms of digital sexual violence and uh, young feminist activists, they organized themselves and they did uh, street rallies and petitions and they used a lot of uh, strategies to pu push forward these agendas to the government and um, there were actually a huge impact. This movement had a huge impact in Korean society um, and leading to actual policy changes in terms of gender-based violence. Also, we had a big nationwide Me Too movement in 2019 in diverse areas of workplaces, such as in politics, entertainment, and culture and sports areas. Uh, and also this Me Too movement actually led a big changes uh, in policy policy framework, such as 
uh, the establishment of gender equality dedicated division in eight government ministries. And also there were uh, several revision of law and policies on gender-based violence. Uh, also, um, we actually had, before we had a provision on a criminal code that criminally pushes abortion, but in 2019, uh, the constitutional court ruled that the abortion ban was unconstitutional and ordered the government to revise the law by the end of 2020. These are the positive aspects of the growing influence of young feminist activists. However, on the other hand, there have been also growing backlashes, especially uh, young men who do not agree that women are actually being discriminated. I just want to uh, show some examples. Um, there were uh, some young male political leaders who have uh, strongly claimed that men are the targets of reverse discrimination. Uh, I put one picture of one symbolic figure. <laughs> His name is Lee Jun Seok. Uh, Lee Jun Seok is like the symbolic figure of political backlash. Um, he was, he used to be the leader of conservative party, uh, which uh, the party which the Yoon song Yeol belongs to now. Um, he actually was using an anti-feminist sentiment among young men to expand his political influence. Uh, especially like there, were also a lot of men's groups, men's rights groups. Their argument is that men are the target of reverse discrimination because especially uh, men's rights are being violated because of forced accusation of sexual violence. Like in from 2018, 2019, um, the women young activists and the women's groups, uh, we are strongly demanding that like there are so many gender-based violence in workplaces are happening. So um, we need to uh, strengthen the law and policies uh, to eliminate the gender-based violence. But on the other hand, uh, the young men thought that these are too much because there are so many men victims whose rights are being violated because of this tightened law on gender-based violence. So these are the main argument of men's rights groups. And it is also the UN's government main policy vision. Like I will explain in detail uh, later slides, but this actually led to the Yoon's policy, the President Yoon's policy vision. He's uh, one of the key promises that the strengthening the penalties and crimes of first accusation of sexual violence. Uh, President Yoon says it is a Yoon po youth policies. Also, there was a fictional frame of gender conflict and gender war between men and women have been created. But uh, women's groups are strongly saying that uh, there is no such conflict between men and women. Uh, only there was anti-feminist Bangladeshis trying to attack gender equality values and women's rights movement. I want to uh, briefly explain about uh, one sports woman. Uh, she is the medalist, her name is An San. Uh, she got gold medal in Olympics in 2021, maybe, uh, but she was the attack on like verbal attack, cyber attack among um, the in internet communities because people said that he, she must be feminist because she has a short hair. So she was being the target of online cyber attacks. So this symbolic uh, example uh, demonstrates that nowadays like feminist 
ideologies, feminist wars are the targets of attacking people. Okay, so now uh, we can talk about the current challenges that women are facing, and we need to see how the current president policy vision is based on the anti-feminist ideologies. Yoon Suk-yeol was elected in the presidential election in, and took office in May 2023. During his election campaign, he actively used the anti-feminist sentiment. He publicly said that there is no structural discrimination against women anymore, and therefore the gender ministry doesn't need to exist anymore. So his number one promise during the presidential campaign was to abolish the gender ministry. And women's groups are strongly against it. Why we are against it? Because it this promise doesn't have any logical backgrounds. This policy, this promise uh, is only relying on his anti-feminist ideology. Um, and the worrying thing is that Yoon and the leading party will intend to still like continuously uh, politically use this agenda to get more vote from people who are against the feminist movements for gender equality policies. Uh, also, there are a lot of harmful effects if this plan is realized. If the gender ministry is abolished, the coordination and integration mechanism for gender equality policies among ministries will be lost. Eventually, the status of gender equality policies will be uh, much weakened. So um, last year from last year, uh, women's groups are strongly uh, resisted, resisting against this policy vision. But uh, there was a small um, victory <laughs> for women's groups. Uh, in October 2022, the last year, October, um, the government organization reform bill, uh, which includes this abolition plan of gender ministry, was proposed to the National Assembly uh, with the support of entire members of conservative leading party in the National Assembly. But eventually, um, this bill was passed in this year, February, but in the final process, the provision on the abolishment of gender ministry, ministry was not included because the oppo opposition party, the progressive party uh, didn't sign on it. So didn't agree to it. So it is like the, yeah, it is uh, partially a victory of women's groups, but uh, we are warning that um, in the next year, April, there will be a general election and there is high uh, possibility that uh, the leading party, the conservative party, will actively use these anti-feminist policies just to want to get more power from young people, from the young people who are against the feminist policies. Which strat strategies uh, that women's rights groups are using to stop this abolishment plan of gender ministry? Um, Women's rights groups established the Korea CSO Coalition Network. Uh, KW initiated this establishment. Now this coalition network have like over 900 organizations. And these 900 uh, member organizations are not entirely women's rights groups. It has, there are labor unions and there are human rights other human rights organizations, civil society network, civil society organizations. So we try to uh, broaden the network of diverse organizations, not only women's rights groups, but also uh, other sectors organizations, because we want to uh, show that um, this agenda, uh, the gender ministry abolishment agenda is not only about the women's rights agenda, but also it is 
that broad human rights agenda. So we uh, intentionally broaden this network to uh, the, the whole part of civil society. And also um, we organize several nation nationwide rallies and online petition campaigns. And um, we visited the office of uh, the members of National Assembly in every uh, single member district because uh, the KWAU is like umbrella organizations. We have so many member organizations who are actually working at the grassroots level in diverse areas in Korean society. So um, they visit the office of the parliament parliamentarians and uh, they are saying that, you know, like I am the citizen of this area. If I want, if you want me to uh, give vote at the next election, you have to um, you have to stop this abolishment plan of gender ministry if you want to uh, get elected in the next election one more time. Uh, you have to do that. Like this kind of strategy we used. Also. Um, we conducted diverse gender awareness campaigns in society because um, abolishment of gender ministry um, have a huge uh, impact, the harmful impact in Korean society, but uh, ordinary citizens actually don't have uh, much opportunity, many opportunities to know the detailed ideas about it. So we try to make a simple, uh, simple, um, simple, like web brochures uh, to uh, explain in a very easy way how um, this abolition agenda is very harmful uh, for the Korean society. Also, we used uh, the international solidarity strategies. Uh, we used the international mechanisms because, uh, like. CEDO and Beijing Platform for Action uh, says that um, there is a clear necess necessity of the national machinery, gender machinery to implement, to effectively implement the gender equality policies. So we try to uh, persuade the politicians and government officers uh, uh, governments by using these international mechanisms uh, to persuade that um, these are not just individual women's rights groups um, groups speaking, but our uh, logic are based on the international mechanisms and gender equality universal values. Also, we organized a joint statement by international NGOs. And also we publicized the international articles criticizing the UN's anti-feminist policies. These are some pictures of our rallies and brochures and online petition campaigns. Okay, um, now uh, which, what are, uh, what are the, what are the key anti-feminist policy visions of the President UN? Okay. Um, the overall policy visions of the current UN government is that they are, uh, the government sees women not as the agent of human rights and change, but just the tool for the population policies or passive beneficiaries or victims under the social welfare systems. So um, in the policy framework and also school textbooks, the term of women, gender, equality, and diversity have been deleted. Instead, the word like happiness, family have been replaced. Um, in the previous government, there was a policy plan to review the revision of criminal code to define rape based on the lack of consent um, and the revised and to revise the law on family to embrace diverse types of family. And these two 
policy agendas are also uh, from the recommendation of CEDO conventions, CEDO uh, committees, but um, under the current UN government, these two policy agendas have been um, deleted. And um, as I said before, uh, the UN government promised to uh, revive the law uh, to strengthen penalties on crimes of force accusations of sexual violence uh, in order to uh, save uh, men victims who are whose rights are being violated because of the gender-based violence law. And uh, UN government uh, keeps uh, maintaining this argument. There is no structural gender discrimination in Korea society at all. Instead, uh, the gender equality and gender discrimination issue is just a personal matter. So um, the big gap between law and practice is not being recognized much. Uh, the UN government basically thinks that, um, you know, like we have well advanced the law and policy. So, there is no gender discrimination because we have law and policies on women's rights. So eventually um, our law and policies become the logic for justifying that like, Korea is the country where men and women are equal because we don't have any law and policies that are gender discriminatory. These are the logic of the current government. Also, um, there is a breakdown of collaborative government system between the government and the civil society. Uh, in the previous government, at least we had a collaboration system uh, between the government and the civil society. So when uh, the law and the policy have been um, implemented or developed, there was like um, the government process where the civil society uh, people are being invited and they can uh, express opinions. Then the government can hear uh, the women's voices and they can correct or revise uh, the law and policies so that uh, this policy framework can be more um, helpful or can actually can be more effectively implemented in women's daily lives. However, there is a total breakdown of this collaboration system between the government and the civil society uh, because uh, the current government is very much hostile to um, the civil society as well as the labor unions because the UN government think that the civil society and labor unions are just uh, the, the individual groups that are just demanding uh, for their own sake. So there is also a threatening of civil rights, such as a freedom of expression or assembly. Uh, the most, the most, the most important thing is that there are a large scale monitoring and project subsidies provided to CSOs in the previous government. And uh, it means that uh, they just want to uh, make the frame um, that uh, civil society organizations are, are corrupted. They have some issues in terms of expenditure of donation money. So uh, people should not trust the civil society or labor unions anymore. So that's one of the, the very um, significant problem uh, that we are facing now. And uh, lastly, uh, the, under the neoliberalism policy vision, uh, human rights policies are just being framed as not fair because there seems provide more opportunities or benefits to people who do not their best, who do not uh, work much to achieve them. So 
gender quota system, for example, um, on from their from uh, their perspective, uh, this system is just giving uh, benefits to women. So it is not fair because the women, even though they are uh, do their they do their they are not doing their best. They just can get a seat. They can just get nominated by party, uh, even though like men are doing their best, uh, but they cannot um, benefit. They cannot get benefit from women favored policies or something. So I uh, just want to uh, conclude. The current situations in Bangladesh is in regressive waves. So current situation in Korea, um, there was, uh, there has been rapid development in legal and policy systems in more than 30 years. And I can uh, say that this is a quite success and victory uh, from women's rights groups. Um, also, we have a very strong activism and civil society movement. However, um, the Korea is the country where uh, there is the highest gender wage gap, glass ceiling index among OECD countries, and uh, gender gap index at the global level is like 1990 out of 149 countries. So there is a clearly big gap between uh, low-end policy systems and the practice, the women's daily lives. This is the dilemma uh, that we are facing. Also, there is a uh, harsh backlash and regressive waves. Uh, people often mistake uh, the establishment of law and policy and gender equality as the complete realization of gender equality. And the politicians are actively using the anti-feminism sentiment for their own political purposes. And uh, regressive policy trends on gender equality and human rights under the current regime. Okay, these are um, the challenges that women's rights facing currently. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, these are some points for thoughts for us. Uh, when we look at the brief history of women's rights movement and the development of gender equality policies, uh, who takes power clearly affects the development of gender equality policies. Um, under the conservative government, uh, Progressive feminist organizations are not uh, being recognized as governance partners, and the civil society space itself is threatened. So uh, women's rights groups actually couldn't actively uh, work uh, for or pushing agendas uh, to the government because the civil society organizations um, cannot actually uh, do a lot of work under the con conservative regime, being threatened, and uh, donation money donation money is lowering down. Yeah. However, um, the comparatively progressive government, I just put uh, comparatively because even during the progressive government at the regime, these are not perfect. Uh, period. There are so many also challenges and struggles that women rights groups have faced, but relatively um, under the progressive government regime, the civil society, the environment surrounding the civil society net, civil society organizations were uh, more better, much better than uh, the conservative government. At least the conservative, uh, at least at that time, uh, the civil society organizations are being recognized as the partners uh, or collaboration partners uh, with the government in terms of the law and policy development. However, <laughs> as you all you as you may know that even um, during the progressive government period, the feminist, the women's rights issues 
have not been uh, necessarily uh, considered priorities. For example, um, the adoption of anti-discrimination law and the LGBT rights. Um, I said that uh, before uh, the Yoon Sung Yeol, pres the President Yoon Sung Yeol, we had a uh, so-called feminist President Moon Jae-in. Uh, his regime was five years. The, his, his period, the, his term was five years, but during that five years, um, women's rights groups and LGBT rights groups, we, all, we, we really, really worked very hard to uh, adopt, to pass the anti-discrimination bill, but it was not passed. Also, there was uh, sexual violence uh, uh, cases against the young feminist workers by the local government had, um, but those are also from the progressive parties. It means that uh, feminist perspective was not uh, necessarily considered as priority during uh, even in the progressive parties. So this is my uh, conclusion, the last slide. Um, how can we collaborate? How can we work together uh, in like, how can we build the feminist solidarity in East Asia? Um, I think when we talk about uh, the East Asian countries, we can list up like these five countries, maybe uh, China, Taiwan, Japan, Hong Kong, and South Korea. Uh, these five countries have so many similarities. For example, those five countries all uh, have economically well-developed countries. And also we uh, do not um, receive the ODA funds uh, because these five countries are ca being categorized as developed countries already. Also, uh, we have the similar social like, problem, <laughs> low birth rates in aging society. It means that um, the politicians and the government um, try to uh, come up with uh, so many plans to address the low birth rates, but uh, from feminist perspective, uh, women are being uh, used as a policy tool under the population policy sometimes. Also the care, uh, is the key agendas in all societies because we are all um, aging, and how can we um, how can we interpret the care uh, from the feminist perspective is the one of the serious uh, concerns among feminist activists, um, and. Um, also, we have patriarchal cultural values and several gender-based, severe gender-based discrimination. Yes, so I think there are many challenges and also possibilities in international solidarities. So uh, my hope is that, uh, like how, I think we can start. I think, of course, we have so many um, we already had so many opportunities and chances for us to collaborate together, but today this webinar is also one of the good opportunities for us to be connected and to share um, and to share our own experiences and like our strategies. So uh, thank you. Uh, I will just stop now. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask or if you have any opinions and comments, yeah, it would be really uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Sunjin, thank you so much. That was really um, very comprehensive and gave us so much to discuss in the time that we have left. While, while you were speaking, so much of what you were describing as the underlying trends in Korean society mm -hmm sounded very familiar to me. You know, even though uh, Korean society maybe uh, looks quite different from society in the United States or in even other, other countries in the region uh, of East Asia, 
So many of these broader trends are familiar, I think, to many of us. And I could see from the comments in the chat that people found familiar points as well. For example, the denial of there being any need for continued um, support of women's rights because some legal changes have already been made, right? We've already improved our laws, so we don't need to do anything more. On paper, we're equal, um, and therefore our work is done, right? That, that, that point is, I think, very familiar. And also the argument that any action, any affirmative action that supports women is a kind of reverse discrimination that hurts men, as if helping one group in society means you have to take something away from another group instead of advancing everyone together. Those two arguments, I think, are um, common uh, around the world um, when, when women's groups try to, to consolidate and continue to move forward. Um, so there were, you mentioned a lot of specific strategies um, and the word solidarity kept coming up. You talked about domestic solidarity and also international solidarity. And I wanted to ask you to just um, talk a little bit more about how that works. So you said, for example, when last autumn, last fall, when, when your organization was helping to lead the fight against abolishing the gender ministry, you said you reached out to other groups besides just women's groups. So not just women coming together, but you said lawyers, media, social influencers, and so on. You went to the offices of um, legislators, your representatives in the National Assembly. Um, what were the kinds of arguments that you made to them? Um, what did you tell men was the best reason that they should support women's rights. And I, I saw in the chat, some people were asking this question of how do you persuade men? What was the best argument to men that they should support women's rights? Okay, that's really, really, <laughs> that's really, really important question because nowadays uh, women's rights groups are also uh, discussing uh, the strategies how to uh, get how to reach the people who are not in favor of us uh, and how can uh, persuade them uh, so that they can support for us so this yeah this is really important question for us too uh, but uh, when it comes to the international strategies that we have used um, especially for uh, stopping the abolishment plan of gender ministry. I personally think that the international strategy uh, we used worked quite very well because um, in the previous seminar um, that was also mentioned that the Korean government especially um, pay attention to uh, the public images at the international level. So um, when we like, when we, when uh, we are like demanding our own agendas, we always uh, edit some the background, uh, the logical background, uh, based on the international mechanism or global uh, global human rights trend, like norms. You know, like this is not our personal agenda. These are the universal values, uh, universal values, and internet, and also these values are already internationally recognized. And these agendas are being mentioned in CEDA Convention, the Human Rights uh, Conventions and like in universal laws. So yeah, these are, um, and when we are uh, talking with, in relation to the international mechanisms, the Korean government actually, they are highly likely to uh, listen to us. <laughs> Um, when uh, we are just saying that uh, we should do that, you should do that or something. Because nowadays in Korean society, uh, women's rights groups are uh, continuously being framed as like profit groups, just for women's rights, individual groups, 
just for the sake of their own profits, only women groups. But we try to uh, we try to change the this frame. Um, we are not uh, demanding this for only us. This is for the Korean society. So that so that's why we actually needed uh, many logical background, especially international mechanisms, because the Korean government, uh, when we are talking about like international mechanisms, they think, oh, okay, because yeah, because the Korean government wants to uh, wants to show themselves that uh, we are we are the leading country. The Korea is the leading country in terms of human rights agendas. And I think this, I think it will also work very well when we are reaching to uh, men uh, who don't, uh, who do not have uh, much many ideas about women's rights agendas because, um, yeah, because uh, we, international human rights agendas the languages are quite easy, but it's very uh, clear and clear. So I think we can also adopt some international languages from the international human rights mechanisms. And these are the basic background for us to get, like, get uh, to, to, to reach them and like, start the conversation with them. Thank you. So we have a lot of questions in the chat and also some questions were submitted before this session, uh, which we appreciate. Thank you everybody who did submit your questions. Amy, would you like to read out a few questions? Yeah, just uh, like as like feminism, uh, the feminism topics become increasing popular online or among people, like people talk more about this issue. But on the other hand, despite those discussions, mm. women's rights are still underprotected and women's status remain the same. Like, how do you see this kind of uh, disparity? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, the society cannot. Uh, rapidly change <laughs> it always takes time and um of course now uh the, under the president yun regime uh the the president yun term will finish after four years it means that in four years still women's rights groups should struggle just for the for the four years so i think um, the women's rights movement should um, do not have to like. We should do. We should be patient. Um, so we are trying to. We are trying to talk more uh, with ordinary citizens. Um, citizens and um, yeah. So we are thinking that we can spend the time with a lot of patience. <laughs> and the thing is that yeah. Nowadays, the feminism is very popular term. Uh, I think it is thanks to the the young growing the young feminist activism who are actually who are, are actually are able to organize the massive organizing online based organizing and um, young feminist activists. Yeah, our young feminist activism, and also we had a Me Too movement, which is nationwide. It's a really, really big wave um, in Korean society. So the feminism is a really, really popular term, and I think the gender awareness of young women have been very, very, very high. Um, so young many young women they know that when they are experiencing gender-based violence or discrimination they already know that these are not their fault this is the social social issue so to address this issue the society should change the government and the politicians should respond to this but the problem is that there is a big gap between men and women Men are still, men's gender awareness are still not very high compared to young men at the same, at their same age. So these are like the, the big gap is 
the one of the key problem on that. So, um, so going back to Catherine's um, question, I think the women's rights groups should uh, expand our commonality more. We should reach to the people who don't uh, know about feminist movement, who are sometimes hostile to the women's rights movement. We have to make a lot of spaces for us to invite them and start the discussion and start to meet people, each other. Yeah, so women's rights groups are thinking that it's, um, yeah, for the four years, the civil society movement will be shrink, shrunk and we will, we're gonna lack a lot of resources. So, um, so it, at this moment, we have to go to the basic, meeting people, uh, expanding our supporters. Yeah, this kind of strategy we are thinking about. Yeah, thank you. I think you also partly uh, answered the next question. People are asking not just like how to bring men to the table, but also maybe talk how to talk to other women like uh, being a woman doesn't necessarily mean you're a feminist mm -hmm. sometimes like women have some like mean comments toward their peers so i guess uh, you have already explained you need to like uh, uh broader your reach and maybe like talk to them more um yeah we also have a couple of questions about the like vote like ele election um basically um you said uh anti-feminism seems to be a tool for those uh, politicians to attract votes from men but like given the disparity between men and women in like generation z is there any hope that feminist parties will just gain more votes uh in the face of anti-feminist parties and also a related question raised by uh, Professor Peterson like is there any statistics showing that women voter uh, women are less likely to vote uh, compared to men yeah thank you mm. okay. um yeah the first question yeah first question um, it makes me so sad yeah we have a general election uh in next year April and the women's rights groups think that, of course, that the abolition plan, uh, abolition plan of gender ministry was uh, stopped partially because the government organization bill was passed without this agenda in the last February. But still, um, the leading party, the conservative party, their approval rate is really, really low. And President Yoon's approval rate is really, really low, like below 30%. Only one year passed uh, since the President Yoon took office and the approval rate is 30% is really low compared to the, uh, the previous um, previous president. So the, so the, so, um, the leading party and the Yoon government will um, probably re rely on um, anti-feminist ideologies because they think that this is the useful strategy for them because they don't have many, uh, they don't have actually any, <laughs> any effective or positive strategies that they can use because they have to get really, really more vote for a short time, short period of time. So they are just going um, to, they are just going to rely on anti-feminist sentiment because they thought that it worked very well because the President Yoon, um, number one promise was abolishment of gender ministry and he was elected as president because, and so the leading party and Yoon said that it was a success strategy. So women's rights groups are really, really worrying about the about that uh, about that point, but uh, yeah, but we are thinking that um, there is the opposition party, uh, Minju Party. This is the pro comparatively comparatively progressive party, uh, but of course not perfect. So um, we try to we we should try to persuade also the politicians. Uh, like th this is the 2023, 
Anti-feminist ideology will not work well. You know, like Korea is the country where we had a big Me Too movement. We have a really, really young feminist activism. And um, it also can relate to, to the second question. Uh, nowadays, the women vote is the, there is a like, the women vote more than men. Yeah, especially young women. They go to the voting place, even though um, they are easy. So I think, yeah, I think the politicians should uh, pay attention to the power of the young women uh, who are willing to go to the voting place and vote for the politicians who are in favor of human rights policies, uh, universal values. So these are the strategies that we are trying to use uh, to persuade politicians uh, for the next uh, general election in, next, yes, in uh, for the next year, yes. Okay, and we also saw a lot of questions uh, like asking about how can we help? Like how can we get involved as an international corporation uh, efforts? Uh, can you elaborate on that? And uh, and another question is like, given your understanding of the situation in China, do you have any suggestions for Chinese feminist or like uh, women's rights groups? Thank you. Mm. Oh, okay, I think um, you know like uh, the last year when we uh, organized the. Uh, a joint statement by international NGOs, uh, more than 101, more than 100 organizations um, signed on that uh, statement. And actually it, um, it was, uh, it was, it brought a lot of uh, media attention and the government also pay attention to that. So, we think that it was really, really effective strategies that we have used, like um, like like using the our international network, the human rights network, who are supporting for a uh, Korean feminist. So I think uh, I think for um, the four years, I think there will be quite uh, many opportunities for us to suggest um, the international. Um, feminist activists or the people who are uh, supporting for us, uh, like statement or like petitions and please sign <laughs> them and join uh, and support for us. And um, the second one is that I think we should um, have a lot of this kind of uh, spaces for us to share our experiences and to talk and uh, we can also share, uh, brainstorm the strategies we can use. Yes, uh, yes. And also for the Chinese feminists, uh, please suggest us. We are really, really want to know uh, the Chinese feminist agendas. And also we want to uh, collaborate if we can also be of help to you. So please uh, be connected and please uh, have some network and build solidarities. Please um, feel free to um, email me <laughs> with brilliant ideas. So thank you, Kyung Jun. That was a very uh, good note to end on because unfortunately we're out of time. But uh, oh. this doesn't need to be the, this will, doesn't need to be the end of the conversation, right? Uh, I'm glad that this webinar has been an opportunity to share strategies uh, from one uh, women's movement in Korea to others, uh, to the women's movements in other countries uh, in Asia and, and frankly around the world. We can all learn a lot from our sisters in Korea. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for your wonderful uh, presentation and your clear sharing of your experiences and thoughts. And thank you to the audience for your excellent questions that have made us uh, think a little more deeply as well. Before you all leave, would you help us by completing this little questionnaire that we're throwing up on the screen? We do find this helpful as we plan our, our next uh, webinars in this series. Uh, and give us your suggestions for uh, future speakers you'd like to hear from and topics that you would like us 
to address. And you can send them to us as well um, at the email address that we'll put in the chat uh, panel. Um, so getting feedback from you and um, staying in touch, I think is a good strategy for making progress in the future. Um, as, as our speaker said, as Kyunjin said, we have to be patient. Uh, it takes a long time uh, to change society. So with that, we thank everyone and see you next time uh, when we hold the next uh, event in the series. Thank you, Kyunjin. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, to listen to my presentation. I was really moved uh, for your great interest in Korea women's movement. Thank you.